In yoga, there's this word called tapas, and tapas means practices that help you to shine. Those practices that show you who you are. Muscle tightness and pain are two of the biggest check engine lights in the body telling you that there's something wrong. When we're in pain, it zaps, literally zaps our prana and depletes us of that inspiration to go out and live our best life. I'm gonna make a lot of people upset who listen to this and have been led to believe that we store emotions in the hips, but that's just not true. We don't store emotions in the body. Our clothes carry so much of our ego. How potent that was for people to walk into the room nude. The primer for anything that we did was just bring your hand to your partner's heart, look in their eyes and breathe with them. When you're standing naked in front of somebody and you just put your hand on their heart and just breathe, that is like one of the most powerful, healing, authentic experiences you can have with any human being. This particular episode is revolutionary yoga, not for stretching. So what is yoga really for? And that unity consciousness, that unity awareness that opens it up for, and also how to actually improve your body, not stretching. Actually stretching may be ruining your body. This is a very interesting conversation. Guys, a lot of love goes into these episodes, so please remember to comment, like, and subscribe to the channel. It helps so much more than I can even say. It goes a very long way. Without too much further ado, today's episode. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us Inspiring Our Evolution, Yogi Aaron. Aaron, how are you there? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Are you serious? It is such a treat to have you here. For those tuning in to Yogi Aaron for the first time, Aaron's a Canadian yoga teacher, renowned for his innovative approach to yoga. Um, there's Applied Yoga Anatomy and Muscle Activation, which... I personally love to call Ayama. It just sounds very Indian and uh, aligns up with the, the vibes of yoga. He wrote the, uh, the book, which is a, a cheeky take on the very famous autobiography of a yogi, the autobiography of a naked yogi. You want to find out more about, more about all that blasphemy right there. <laughs> right there. And, uh, and conquering shame, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and also his role in founding um, in Costa Rica, the Blue Osa yoga retreat which you know when you look at what's going on over there it's beautiful and sublime and when you talk about how you manifested that or your mum helped you manifest that um he's got over 30 years of experience he's dedicated his life to teaching yoga and ultimately he's helping people live pain free um through combining some of these ancient practices with a more modern scientific understanding his work uh, is starting to get somewhat controversial, as if it wasn't already with the um, the Naked Yogi. Now it's now it's called the Stop Stretching Podcast, which uh, basically challenges conventional yoga as the West sees it, um, and is basically emphasizing muscle activation and alignment over stretching. So, Aaron, thank you so much yes. for being here. It is such a treat. Thank you for that amazing introduction. <laughs> <laughs> have, uh, have I have I captured the uh, the rebellious spirit <laughs> correctly? You, you there? sure have, and I, I love how you picked up on the autobiography part. That was really cool because that's exactly was my intention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I this podcast could have started in two places because part of me wants to really find out where, like, just I wanted to sort of be taken, transported back with you to that moment where you're in India on a retreat and this boulders coming flying down at you. But then also like just the the vibe of like, hey, I'm going to set up like naked yoga retreats. So I could start with either of those questions. Maybe I'll leave it up to you. Choose your own adventure. Which one do you want to go down? Like, <laughs> where you, do you, you want to start? You pick your poison. <laughs> well, I, 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 maybe we'll find our or way inspiration. to. Maybe we'll find. Maybe we'll find our way to um to to the the naked yoga. And so yeah, bring me into the moment where you're in India. You're in a retreat. The closest vehicle is 26 kilometers away. There's a boulder flying down at you. Like, bring me into that moment with you what is going on? Like you're already a yoga teacher at this point and, but you're about to face a serious physical calamity. 
that experience was, there were so many things kind of coinciding at that particular moment. Um, so that happened in September of 2020 or sorry, 2007. And so Can you 2007, describe a little bit of what happened as well? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So that, that year I turned 35, I had already been established as a yoga teacher and I had my community, my group, my Kula. Um, and I was a few months before that in February, I was leading a yoga retreat in Costa Rica. And so I had just found the place where we had opened up Blue Osa Yoga Retreat and Spa. And of course, you know, at that moment, it wasn't actually called Blue Osa yet. Um, we were still trying to figure out what it was going to be called, but we found the property. The intention was set. Um, and so I was, you know, I love leading retreats, uh, trips, pilgrimages to India. And that particular day was the final day of this trip. And it was a hard trip. I mean, not for me personally, but just for the people, um, they, you know, the, some of the hiking that we did was a little bit beyond some people's capacity. So they really had to dig deep. But that's also part of it. That's part of the journey is to get people to dig deep within themselves and to face themselves. So um, so I was really happy to be on this last day. And I remember the morning that we were leaving. So just to kind of set the stage, we were on the, in this place called Tapovan, which means heaven on earth. And this is also the spiritual, one of the spiritual homes of Shiva, uh, which is the god of transformation. Um, sometimes he's also called the destroyer. And, and that gets confusing, but he destroys, you know, our ego, for lack of better words, ergo transformation. And so we, we also got together and we did this mantra, um, the Gayatri mantra, and then we started off, and as you said earlier, it was 26 kilometers to the vehicles, and we're trekking down this glacier, and I'm thinking, yay, we made it. <laughs> Nobody is injured. <laughs> that is not the thought you had. <laughs> oh, no. And so I'm like, okay. Um, somebody yelled, you know, look up. And I looked up just way too late. And this boulder twice the size of a of a, a bowling ball comes down the mountain and it I turn and it just hit me like right in my leg and broke my femur literally in half. Um, now, for the record, I didn't know that it was broken. I was thinking, oh, my leg is just bruised. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was in denial. And so but I knew that we had to get off the mountain and we also had to move where I was and uh, where I was, was not in a safe area. And so as we tried to move me, I have to tell you something, it was the most excruciating pain um, I ever have had in my life because the bone, you know, was broken. And so with the leg was just kind of hanging there and it was just, it was a mess. Um, so you asked me, like what was going through my mind, what was going through my mind was a lot of things. Um, I, you know, one of the, one of the greatest lessons my, one of my teachers gave to me was if you're going to be a mess, be a happy mess. And so I couldn't do anything, but just laugh at the situation. Oh, so crying. I was in tears of, as you can imagine, but it was also laughing uh, because it was just so comical that here we are and here this happened to me. Um, and I thought, what is it that Shiva wants me to learn today? <laughs> mm. And, and I felt like that was such a monumental moment in my life. Cause I, like I said, I turned 35 and, and bought this place that we were going to call blue Osa. So it was kind of like, I feel like that was in yoga. There's this word called tapas. And tapas means practices that help you to shine. Um, and, and also, but the, but the deeper part of tapas is those practices that show you who you are. 
And so we kind of see a lot of people in the yoga world dancing around tapas. And and when I say dancing, it's kind of like they put their toe into it and then get back out. And so it's fair to say like most yoga people don't really practice tapas, but tapas is the only way that we can uh, transform. And so for me, that tapas was getting a boulder throwing it at me. And it made me kind of ask one kind of continuous singular question, which was, how am I going to choose to respond to this situation right now? Uh, what is it? What is, what choices am I going to make in this moment? And so that kind of like my that lesson my teacher imparted, like if you're going to be a mess, be a happy mess, um, kind of gave me the clarity <laughs> to make better choices in my own attitude and how I was going to respond. And it was constantly like. It, it wasn't just like, okay, let's get off the mountain. It was like, we had to get to Delhi and that I w- it was three and a half days from the time I got hit by the boulder to when I had surgery. Uh, it took three and a half days and uh, there was landslides that stopped us along the way. Um, it was just all kinds of stuff. And so it was nonstop. It was continuous. And, but having that come back to as a practice was really critical. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, I love, there's a few things and the topus is, is really interesting to dive into. Um, but also just, you know, just to add to the story, I guess the, the, the 35 is like the, you know, that's five, seven year cycles. And they say, you know, that we have these seven year cycles and, you know, the, the energy of Shiva is you're referring to transformation. It's like, yes, there's that destruction vibe, which is like, yes, but it's more like, let's get rid of that to make way for the new, you know? And so there's the energy of what was new that was the, that was birthed out of there. And I, I, um, again, yeah, like just, just curious to sort of see, cause of, as of that point, you, you obviously got surgery, you recovered. Um, but from there, like the new that was birthed was this, was this Ayama. So tell me a little bit more about like what's going on because you've gone from being, well, Mr. Yoga and Mr. Stretching for the longest while to all of a sudden, like you're still the yogi, but you're like, guys, guys, stop stretching, stop stretching. <laughs> so if, it, yeah, and that's probably going to be the title of this podcast is like yoga, but stop stretching. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's I love so- that. Take it and run with it. <laughs> yoga, but stop stretching. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, you know, for the mind, it's like, and it's so interesting to feel because we do conflate now in the West, yoga, we're stretching. Like in the East, yoga is all this other stuff beyond stretching. It's actually stretching is like one small little paradigm within it. Um, if it is called stretching, it's just asana really. But anyway, um, I'm digressing. But yeah, the 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 point being like, yeah, yoga, stop stretching. Um What's what's going on in there and how did that from your challenge of the broken femur, how was this birthed? Well, I I mean, I had a lot of underlying problems before the femur broke. And so I those when the femur broke, when the boulder hit me, it really kind of catapulted a lot of problems and made them a lot worse. It exposed a lot of you know, underlying issues. And so I got into yoga initially when I was 18 because I felt like I needed to stretch. And so for me, stretching equated and yoga kind of equated in my mind, like, you know, being young, being healthy, um, you know, staying youthful and, and, and limber. Yeah. You hear this word limber, like old people, lose their ability to be limber or have limberness. Hmm. I don't know what the word correct word Lim- is, but yeah, anyway, I think, the, I, think I, think I just lim- made up one. Limb- limberality. <laughs> limberality. I like it. Well, we're going to take it and run with it. So I started doing yoga, but one of the things that happened to me, and I didn't realize this, like I, I kind of knew this, but I didn't really put two and two together until I started writing my book. And as I got into yoga, I quickly hurt myself. I hurt my back, not in a yoga class, just in life. But I remember like thinking, oh my God, I need to stretch my back more. So that, and stretch my hamstring. So that pushed me into doing a lot more aggressive forms of yoga um, styles, uh, power yoga, shtanga yoga. 
and then when I, as I got into that, I, you know, would stretch more, but one of the things that happened simultaneously was I really screwed my back up. And so I, that was another thing. Like I started developing this ego of someone who has a bad back. And so enter the boulder, you know, enter that. And, you know, I exacerbated a lot of problems um, and I was able to kind of fix it. You know, I was still young enough that my body recouped, rebounded. And then after 25 years of practicing yoga um, and, and just for the record, like over the years, obviously it wasn't my yoga practice wasn't about stretching. Like it wasn't like that wasn't the central theme anymore, but it was still a big part of the practice. Right. And then I ended up in the emergency room of a hospital with an orthopedic surgeon telling me that I might need a spinal fusion in my lower back. And that was like despite, a moment. Despite all the yoga that you're practicing. Yeah. Right. Okay. It, yeah. And what I came to realize was it was because of all the stretching um, and forward bends uh, more specifically, but, but it was because of all the stretching. And so no, you know, in 25 years of working with like really top tier yoga people, like yoga teachers, top tier, um, you know, I could, I could throw some names out there. I won't, but uh, I could throw some very big names out there, but working with very top tier yoga teachers, not in movement specialists, not one person ever said to me, uh, Aaron, your hamstrings are tight because your hip flexors are not activated properly. Your, your body, your back and your hamstrings are tightening up as a response and, and because certain muscles aren't working, so your body is trying to protect itself. Uh, so the muscles tighten up as a response is a protective mechanism. So when the body is, senses instability, um, it will tighten up. And so I don't know how much ice you get down, you know, down under. Uh, <laughs> but... Not in Melbourne, but if I go not too far below, we have Antarctica. So the winds yeah, so here are very Antarctica, cold. But I don't know how many cold days you guys get, but, you know, being from North America, especially in Canada, you know, that first sort of, of, of ice or cold day, there's ice on the ground and you don't expect it. So you kind of, you kind of step out on it and all of a sudden you, you're, you feel unstable. What do you do? You tighten up. So when we step on ice, we tighten up and as a protective mechanism. And so from a yogic perspective or from a, a, a muscle tightness perspective, muscle tightness is just a symptom of muscles not working. And so that that was the underlying problem. So the short story is that I, after that experience, I realized I didn't know much. I didn't know as much as I thought I did. And so I invested myself in studying muscle activation uh, practices. And I studied with the, my teacher, Greg Roscoff, who started muscle activation technique. And as I started getting into that world, what I realized was nobody was transferring this knowledge into the yoga world. So that's how I started getting into teaching and creating uh, applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation for two reasons. One, because yoga teachers just don't understand biomechanics, basic biomechanics. So my goal was to start putting that information forward to empower yoga teachers with, um, there's a word that we like to use in yoga, right knowledge. <laughs> you know, like what, a, what a actual hip flexors do. Uh, we always talk about opening them, but we very sell, you know, if you ask a thousand yoga teachers, what are the hip flexors and what do they do and what's the function of those muscles? you would be very hard pressed to find one in a thousand be able to actually tell you. Uh, so that was part of it. And then the other part of it was um, starting to work more on getting the muscles activated. And so once we start, when we say activated, what we mean is that the muscles start to improve their function. As muscle function improves, and the definition of muscle function is a muscle that can contract and contract on demand. So a muscle that has that ability to work properly. And so once it does, guess what happens? Muscle tightness is gone. Uh, we have more greater range of motion. 
And more importantly, you know, we don't have to deal with pain in the body anymore. What are the more common ones? Because you're referring to the hip flexors there. I'm sure there's some like regular culprits that show up in your crosshairs. What are some of those that you can speak to? Um, yeah, yeah. Just, what are some of those? Sure. So the, the biggest one is the psoas and uh, the psoas major. And so the psoas where major is, is, where a, is that? Is that in your butt somewhere or you yeah, going <laughs> close? It's actually connected to the inside of your femur bone um, on this little kind of knobby thing uh, that sticks out of the inside of the femur bone called the lesser trunk canter. So it attaches there and it weaves up uh, through the pelvic bone um, and then it attaches to the lumbar spine. It, it actually attaches to the front part of the lumbar spine. And it's the only muscle in the body that connects the, the legs to the spine, number one. Number two, it's the only muscle that is sitting in the front part of the spine, the anterior part of the spine. And so one of the major jobs of the psoas major is to stabilize the spine. And specifically the lower back, what did I end up in the hospital for? Instability, and, and the solution was to give me a spinal fusion. So the problem with stretching is it, is, is it really make it destate, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It destabilizes the muscle. Uh, it inhibits yeah. the muscle from being able to work properly. So by doing all that stretching, we look at yoga postures, the way that a lot of yoga teachers teach certain yoga postures, we're actually abusing our psoas major and completely debilitating. That was the word I was looking for, debilitating it. Wow. Okay. So the psoas is this major culprit because it's, yeah, like you said, it's in the, it's quite central in terms of, well, in your body, but also it's the thing that connects your lower body to the base of your upper body, basically yes. through the hips. Yeah. Um, yeah. can we talk hips for a quick sec? Because it seems like yeah, everybody sure. I speak to like hips are just this, you know, you start, it's this bowl of emotions, which you were here in yoga. Um, but then also it's, it just seems like, <laughs> do, does, is there anybody with not tight hips? Like, does that exist? Am I? Yeah. I mean, I don't really have tight hips. Um, but sometimes I do. So, you know, we're sitting down right now talking, I probably will stand up and notice that there's some muscle tightness in the very beginning, but because I do a lot of these muscle activations, my, the tightness disappears very quickly. Um, but if I do notice some chronic tightness appearing, that's a sign to me. Anytime we have tightness, it's the body trying to protect itself. So my mind goes to what muscles aren't working uh, properly. So, but the, the tightness in the hips is a symptom of the body, again, trying to stabilize itself. So because the muscles aren't working properly, it's like your brain sends out an SOS message, tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. And just like when you stepped out on ice, you tighten up, you froze immediately. Uh, so when the body senses danger or senses um, instability, it will just tighten up. So it is possible to get rid of that tightness. Absolutely. Um, by stretching it though, again, we're just going to begin having a negative impact on those muscles, uh, which is going to lead us actually to becoming more tight because if we're creating more instability through stretching, the result is always going to be more tightness. Hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec, but I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And he's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more 
gain control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emirate at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emirate, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www amrit.coach forward slash life that's www.amrit.coach forward slash l-i-f-e there is a link in the show notes below to book in that call and yeah if you want to take your journey further if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life if it's for you please do check it out and without too much further ado once again for your spirit for yourself today's podcast what is the difference between stretching and muscle activation? And I know if we were on a yoga mat, maybe it'd be much easier to, <laughs> to palpably experience the difference between the two, but maybe yeah. just for the sake of the podcast, if you can help clarify what some of the differences between stretching and muscle activation really are. Yeah, sure. So if we're talking about, <clears throat> okay, so it's important to understand that muscles work in pairs. And, and so when one muscle is shortening or contracting, the other muscle should lengthen. Now, some people use the word stretch. The better, the proper term is it relaxes. That's really what it does is it relaxes, but it's proportionate to how much the opposite muscle is contracting. So biomechanically, we call this the agonist and antagonist muscles. So if you flex your bicep, which is something we learned in grade school, if we flex our bicep, what happens? The triceps elongate. And so in the case of my tight hamstrings, and so I'm sure a lot of your listeners have tight hamstrings, the tight hamstrings <laughs> are a symptom of the opposite muscles not contracting. So the group of opposite muscles, because the hamstring is a hip extensor. So the opposite muscles is the hip flexors. And so we put the psoas at the top of that list. Uh, but another one that's important to put in there also is the quads. And one of the quads, which actually has hip flexion function, is the rectus uh, femoris. So it's kind of like the one that sits on top. And, um, and from what I've read and everything I understand and have directly experienced, when the rectus femoris is engaging properly, the hamstring tightness disappears like immediately. And so what's important for people to understand, and just as a side note, like this is something you and I learned in grade school. Like this isn't revolutionary science, but somehow we've forgotten this basic knowledge. And I'm using the word knowledge very specifically. It's knowledge that we learned, it's basic anatomical knowledge that we have kind of conveniently rewritten and forgotten and substituted with muscles need to become longer. And all I can say is it's horse pucky. Muscles actually need to be able to shorten properly. And if they do that, the surrounding muscles will actually relax. Uh, properly. So what I should have been doing when I got into yoga was not stretching my hamstrings, but actually starting to work on improving um, the, the hip flexors, specifically rectus femoris, so as major, getting those muscles activated. And so to go to your question, how do you activate those muscles? There's a few different ways. Um, but basically what we want to do is get those muscles in an isometric way to shorten uh, for brief periods of time. 
And that shortening, that isometrically isometric shortening or contraction of those muscles starts to reestablish this neuromuscular connection between the brain and the muscles. So but earlier already, I... Sorry, just like, aren't they already mm -hmm. contracted? So you're shortening uh, them further. Um, they're not shortening properly. And so that there's a neuro, there's a neuro inhibition. And with most people, it, especially if it, you raised your hand, uh, so I'm sure a lot of your listeners raised their hand. If their hamstrings aren't, con if their hamstrings are tight because the opposite muscles are not shortening properly and they're not shortening properly because the communication system between the brain and the muscles have been compromised. And so what we want to do is to reestablish, and I'm not using woo-woo science, by the way, like this isn't like, you know, um, a psychic connection, if you will. This is literally like a ne literal neuromuscular connection. It's been compromised and it's been compromised due to stress, trauma, and overuse. Those three factors do create inflammation. And that inflammation has started to, this is a good word, impair that communication system, literally. Now, if you're younger, it will bounce back. So when I was young and doing all this stretching and, you know, really <laughs> abusing my body in yoga, I got away with it because I was young and, and that neuromuscular connection eventually uh, came back. But as I got older and then when the boulder hit me, it just got more and more compromised. And so we see evidence of this with most older people who I'm going to say, and I don't mean this in a nasty way, but kind of look old. And by looking old, I mean like they they look hunched over. There's a tightness in their body. There's a limitation, uh, limitation in range of motion. Um, there's this contraction. And so that happens because muscles stop losing their ability to contract properly. And it all is related into that neuromuscular connection. So that's where, that's the domain that I live in in improving that neuromuscular connection. What's important for people to remember, take this away, muscle tightness, and then the result is going to be pain eventually. Uh, muscle tightness and pain are two of the biggest check engine lights in the body telling you that there's something wrong. You know, and so, you know, you're from down under when you go up to the outback, one of the things that you want to pay attention to is that check engine light. When it comes on, you don't want that check engine light to come on when you are in the outback. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to it, that you get your car serviced. So for us as human beings, and I'm going to say yogis for the time being, that we want to pay attention to muscle tightness. It's telling us that there's something uh, wrong and needs to be addressed. Yeah, this is um, profound because I'm seeing like even just face forward, like my hamstrings like that and sort of seeing the hip flexors on the other side of them and like you said, the quads as well. And then yeah. recognizing that actually the, the general rule is just to keep stretching the hamstring. But yes. then as I'm stretching the hamstring, I'm probably just contracting the hip flexors further. And your invitation is to sort of actually bring ourselves back into the hip flexors and build a relationship with them. It's okay to contract them so we can build that neuromuscular connection and then allow them to actually eventually rebound into further relaxation and open up. Am I kind of getting it right? Yeah, almost there. So let me give you an example since we're on, you know, hip flexors and hamstrings. So this is this is actually a wonderful thing to do every day. So if you can do this every day, uh, this is one of one of the great ones. So you're on your back and you want to stretch your hamstrings. What do you do? You bring your leg up and depending on your, I'm going to use this word, I hate using it, but I'll just say for this moment, flexibility, you can grab your foot and then you grab your foot and you bring that leg closer to you. Now, if you're stiff biff, and you're not bendy wendy, uh, you grab a towel and you put that towel around your foot and then you pull the foot towards you, right? Or you grab the leg and pull it towards you. And you're therefore 
forcing the hamstring to go beyond its range of motion. You're trying to address that tightness. Now, you said earlier, yes, then you're shortening uh, all of the hip flexors. You're, you are and you're not. You are shortening them, but you're doing it in a passive way. And so the problem with stretching a muscle like the hamstring and forcing it to lengthen, you're also now having a negative impact, not just on the hamstrings, but on also all of the hip flexors. So from my perspective, and this is part of flipping the script on, you know, stretching and yoga is instead of like grabbing the foot, you are just holding the leg there. So if you're lying on your back, your arms are out like a T and you bring, you bring that leg up as high as you can and you hold it there. Let's just say for six seconds. So the general rule in muscle activation is six seconds. And then we slowly lower the leg down and we repeat that for a total of six times. So we do that five more times, total six. And so as you're doing that, you are starting to integrate that neuro pattern to the, the quads to start engaging properly. The very first time you do that exercise, you're going to notice, oh my God, my hamstrings are tight. But after you do it, usually by about the fifth or sixth time, you're going to start to notice the hamstring tightness has disappeared. And that's because the quads start working. The quads are starting to engage uh, properly and they start to get recruited. So that's a great one to get all of the hip flexors uh, kind of working. But that's the fundamental difference between what I'm trying to teach versus what is being taught. One methodology says we should lengthen the hamstrings by forcing these hamstrings to open. The other one is saying, no, movement, there needs to be accountability in movement, meaning like I need to get my body to work within its own range of motion. And sometimes you kind of hear two, there's kind of two words for the better way of moving of what I'm describing. Sometimes it's called dynamic stretching. I don't like that term because it's reinforcing, again, this idea of stretching. You're actually not stretching anything. What you're doing is getting your quads and hip flexors to activate so that once they start activating, the hamstrings just start to lengthen. A better word, again, is just relax. Uh, so I usually like to just call it dynamic movement. I mean, let's move dynamically. Anytime we move dynamically, there's always going to be accountability. And when there's accountability, we're always going to create more stability. I'm loving just the infuriating nature of some of the activation stuff you just described because I could, <laughs> some part of me loves to beat the anvil on just pulling that foot forward as I'm doing the hamstring stretch. It's like, come on, just lengthen already. You know? But re recognizing that like this six seconds is not very long and six reps is not very many. Um, and how, I don't want to use the word subtle, but um, simple is probably the right word, how simple it is to engage this um, process. Um, you must love that. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, um, I do. And people that work, I work with feel it and they actually feel like I had my uh, business partner with me on this retreat I just taught last week. And, um, and so he came and he wanted to take the retreat with me. That was a pain-free muscle activation retreat. And so he's into boxing. I mean, he works out with a trainer, his workouts last three hours. And he said to me at the end of the first class, that was almost harder than anything I've done and we're just doing. And I, the word you used was perfect, subtle. These movements are subtle. We're, one of the axioms of a yama is less is more. Like let's just lessen the effort because when we start pushing ourselves, we actually create more stress. And when we create more stress, we create more inflammation. So we're trying to actually approach this more from a rest and digest uh, state and as we do that, we're able to start rebuilding that neuromuscular connection. That neuromuscular connection starts coming back uh, more so. So the word you used was subtle. Like that's, it, it is very, very subtle work that we're doing. The impacts of what we're discussing um, on longevity, well, from a very practical sense in some way as well, because obviously there's that, you know, there's like, well, touch wood, probably oversharing here, but, you know, my, my grandmother, she 
she, um, in her final years, she fell over in the bathroom and that was her, you know, and then she was bedridden after that because the, the bone couldn't, the bone couldn't heal, um, once you get to a certain age. Um, but then also like, yeah, you know, recognizing that falls is like a big thing. So there's that element of longevity. Um, but then also as you're describing it, um, the word limber sort of pops back into mind <laughs> actually. Um, yeah. Can you describe the, the, the benefits towards longevity through this Ayama approach? Yeah. So as I, I mean, I remember growing up and giving my grandfather a hug, both of them actually. And I remember like patting them on the back as we do our loving grandparents, like, Oh, you're so cute. Um, they, you know, his back was like a stiff as a board. And so, you know, that's from having these hunched shoulders. That's from not really moving that much. That's from years of, of tightness, just, you know, the muscles just tightening up. And again, from a neuromuscular standpoint, if we can rebuild that connection, the muscles will start working again. What we need to do is just start rebuilding it. So my teacher, Greg Roscoff, who's the creator of muscle activation technique, says that age in the way that we were just des describing it, this kind of stiffness, this loss of limber limberness, like that's how we would describe somebody who gets older and that we can actually turn that around when we start rebuilding that neuromuscular connection. Uh, and so if we can start doing that, it can, it, it's, it's one of the secrets to uh, kind of staying young is just keeping those, that connection strong. And again, I want to just kind of stress a point, like that connection becomes compromised due to stress and which is, created because of trauma and overuse. So when you keep overusing a certain muscle, if you keep, you know, hunching yourself over um, your computer screen, if you're typing on your computer uh, keyboard all day long, you know, that's going to create this overuse, which is then going to start creating this trauma and stress in the joints. And that the result of stress is inflammation. And so you keep, that's why I said the check engine light is pain because when we have inflammation, we feel pain, right? So that pain is telling us, hey, there's something wrong. But what most people do is, you know, take drugs, um, you know, and then, or they stop moving or they, and they, or they immobilize the joint. So you see a lot of older people, well, even younger people, for God's sakes, um, putting knee braces on their knee. What are they, what are those knee braces doing? Well, they're doing the jobs of the muscles. And so it's just exacerbating a point, like the muscles aren't working. Uh, why aren't they working? Because that neuromuscular connection has become uh, compromised. So you can start to turn back the clock if we can get that connection, uh, you know, rebooted. My, Greg uses that a lot. Like, it's like, you know, hooking a battery cables up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, that's a great metaphor to sort of tune into the, the question that I had was how long does it take? Like obviously every person's different in terms of building that connection. Um, but does it take years? Does it take months? Like in your experience? The you it, it's instantaneous. I can get somebody strong instantaneous. I actually had a guy um, and quite frankly, I was surprised. I mean, I'm always surprised by this stuff because I, I just had a, a situation last week um, was fascinating. That's a whole story, which I'm not going to get into. But the one client came in and probably a lot of your listeners deal with sciatica, you know, sciatic pain. And I got him on my table. I went through, I spent 90 minutes with him. When he came into my table, he was probably about an eight or nine out of 10 for a level of pain. So, you know, 10 being the strongest, zero, nothing. He was probably about an eight or nine. When he got off the table, and I'm not, I'm not being glip here, it was zero. He, he jumped, he, he's, he's like, I don't feel anything. And he went, you know, he leaned back, he kind of leaned forward, he leaned to the side. It's like, I don't feel anything. What do we do? We got the muscles to start doing their job. So I, earlier I said muscles should be able to contract and contract on demand. Why? Muscles have two jobs. They move bones 
and they stabilize joints. You know, they literally, uh, literally hold joints in place. When they don't do that, the joints are kind of just sitting there. And then that action starts to create a lot of stress. Um, and so we need to get those muscles working. So when I worked on him, I basically got the muscles around the spine starting to do their job. Uh, so they could, you know, work. So it's instantaneous. Now there's a caveat to that. Of course, <laughs> caveat is it because of the level of stress that he either inflicts on his body and because of his history, those muscles stop working after a while. So we need to then keep doing our muscle activations. And so, because maybe like one day he turns his body wrong and then, you know, the pain, some of the pain starts coming back or he was a walker. He loved to walk. So maybe he just went out walking one day and his muscles weren't working and then the walking just made it worse. So we need to keep up with our muscle activations. And there's earlier, I said, stress has a negative impact on muscles. So what we need to do, and it's not actually on the muscles, it's on that neuromuscular connection. So what we want to do then is raise our stress tolerance level up. So by doing these muscle activations continuously, aka the one I described to you, lie on your back, slowly bring your leg up as high as you can, start doing that every day before you exercise, of course, or before you know you start your day, do that every day and you're going to notice that over time that hamstring tightness disappears all of that limitation range of motion goes away probably some aches and pains start disappearing because those muscles start doing their job properly so you, we we're looking to increase the stress tolerance level so those muscles don't shut down it's fascinating there's um and tuning back into the the neuromuscular connection i can sort of see what you're describing there is like with the process of myelination where basically you're forming new neural pathways obviously the old pathway is quite robust and so the, there's this natural tendency to go that way but you're myelinating a new pathway as well so stepping into that new connection reinforcing it for those that are tuning in and maybe myself even included <laughs> discipline, <laughs> um, the invitation to discipline for your practices um how do you how do you invite um, people into into levels of discipline for supporting themselves with these techniques on an ongoing basis? Well, my mission my mission is to keep myself healthy and strong as long as possible. And part of that, then outside of that, is to help as many other people um, access this information because what I have found. Um, like when we're in pain, we become debilitated in life. We don't, we don't have like the pain zaps our life force energy. There's a word in yoga we call prana. You know, when we're in pain, it zaps, literally zaps our prana and depletes us of that inspiration to go out and live our best life. Um, I know from my own pain journey, I've, I've dealt with a lot of chronic pain in my life that when I've been experiencing chronic pain, um, I can't do anything. So my goal is to help as many people as possible uh, get out of pain. And so that's why I wrote the book called Stop Stretching, um, which is, you know, people can access that. I've created a lot of content. I'm on a mission to start getting more people teaching this stuff. So I've created like um, some online courses for that that are, go into this stuff, you know, as deep as people want to go into it. Um, so I'm, I'm on a mission to help as many people. So people, anybody listening, it's really easy to access this stuff. Um, you just got to plug into it. <laughs> I'm going to put a link in the show notes below to, um, to the book and, and the courses and your YouTube channel, because there's a lot of great content on YouTube there. Um, yeah. short activation techniques, um, and you yeah. can practically see the differences as well. Um, and you do a, a very, well, it's very helpful for me. I uh, probably shouldn't speak on behalf of everybody. Um, how grandiose of me. Um, just the, the, you do the stretch, which is like, this looks like the yoga stretch and this is what you normally would do. And also this is the muscle activation technique now from this point. And you can sort of see the subtle differences um, that kick in. 
In terms of checks and balances, so what about some of us that are tuning in? It's like, mate, I've got more than just tight hips, like my neck and shoulders and my elbows and my this and that. So <laughs> and the laundry list continues. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out like, because I, let's just take me as an example, like I'm going out to do a bit of a workout. Um, would I just focus on activating those muscles which I'm recruiting in the workout or prior to exercise or in the morning would I just try and do all my activations that are required for all of my muscles? Like what's the what's the approach or is it just one, like it can't be sort of one size fits all? Yeah. Yes, 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 and yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've answered all my own questions. <laughs> I'm still lost. <laughs> can, you, can you explain? <laughs> so there's so much to unpack there. Um, mm. So first of all, just start doing some muscle activations. And so, you know, like, for example, I'm. you talked about tight shoulders and tight neck. So much of that could be related and probably is related to hips. If your hips are tight uh, and your lower back is tight, then that's going to have a negative impact on other areas of the body. I will tell you, like for probably some of your listeners deal with knee issues. So many, when I say so many, I mean probably 90 to 95%, maybe even more than that, uh, of knee issues is related to muscles in the hips not working properly, glutes. Um, are, are a huge factor in knee problems and the psoas. So those two major muscles, getting them working is just really important. And right away, you're going to start seeing a huge difference in the way that you move um, and, and, and so on and so forth. I've had muscle activation therapists work on me. Uh, and I've, I've seen it not only on myself, but on other people that I've worked on but a lot of my, I've, I've done tests where I've tested like hamstring tightness, for example. And so they'll be working on something upper body, like, you know, transverse abdominis, trunk flexors, um, like psoas minor, rectus abdominis. They'll get those muscles working. My hamstring tightness disappears. So again, when the body senses instability, it tells everything to tighten up. So much of neck tightness is, again, related to what's going on uh, below, uh, not necessarily in the neck. We're always going to the therapist, like, you know, massage my tight traps, please. Get rid of my tight traps. But that those tight traps, a lot of times, are related to the lower traps not activated. And, you know, you just mentioned earlier that you work out in the gym. If I walked into your gym and tested, and I can test muscle strength. I know whether or not muscles are working. If I walked into that gym and tested 100 people's traps, I bet you 99.9 .9 of them uh, would be testing weak. And so that's a really important thing to kind of think about. Like, you know, if you're going into the gym weak and you're putting load into your muscles, uh, you know, that's going to make you not just weaker, it's going to cause a lot of problems. And that's why you see so many people that work out uh, intensely, you know, have a lot of um, issues. You know, just as a side note, one of the things that I learned when I started working out, and it was a wee young lad, <laughs> probably about 14 at the time, but I worked out with a lot of trainers in those early years. But one of the things that they always said to me was, make sure you do your first couple of sets, low weights, really slow. And that's something you never see in the gym. You never see people doing that. But when you slow down and you work with really light weights, you actually start building that neuromuscular connection. And it's something that I didn't, I didn't really clue into. It took me about 40 years plus to figure that out, that piece of wisdom. But it really is true. There's a lot of truth to that because when I'm doing, let's use dumbbell curls, you know, and my, you know, normally I might work out with 30 pounds, 35 pounds. Okay. So the first set, so I'm going to maybe do 10 pounds, 10 or 15 pounds, and I'm going to go really slow. And at the top, I'm going to really contract mentally. I'm contracting the hamstring and then I'm really going to slow it down as I lower them down. I'm going to do that maybe 10 to 15 times. And that starts to build that neuromuscular connection. So there's ways that you can 
integrate this philosophy into workouts. Um, part of it is just making sure you're strong, make sure that those major muscle groups are working, make sure your traps are, are working properly, that your pecs are working properly. Um, and of course the muscles in your hips. And then, so when you do go work out and, or like you go for that walk or you go hiking or whatever it is that you're doing, if you're strong, when you start, you get stronger through the activity. If you're weak, when you start, you not only stay weak, but you get weaker. Uh, as you continue on. So it's really important to do that. I always tell people, do as much as you can. Um, some days I just do 10 minutes of muscle activation. Other days I'll spend 45 minutes um, working on just stuff. And then of course I've learned how to integrate it into my workouts in the gym as well. So I, I really focus on that. But if I go to the gym for an hour, typically I'll do muscle activations for about 30 minutes. Um, sometimes with a little light, 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 light load, <laughs> um, and other times with no loads, just using my body. Um, so you, it's, it's just something that you keep doing and you do different ones each day. So when, when I give a routine to somebody, typically I'll say, just do this routine today, do this routine tomorrow, and then just keep flipping it. Diagnosing, um, I'm sure some people tuning in want to sort of figure out which muscle activations they should be working on and which ones um, are not uh, immediately required, um, may emerge later as required. Um, syllabus, how do you, how do they go about um, said body of work? Yeah, it really depends on where the person is feeling pain. But, you know, we look I always work big and then go in. And so start with the major muscles first. So what are some of the major muscles? Back, your, all your back muscles. So one of my favorite muscle activations is um, the one I just gave to you. And that's, this has actually been one of my little faves lately. Lying on the back, bring the leg up, you know, keep the leg as straight as possible. Don't bend the knee, but just kind of hold it there. Um, if you kind of want to take it up a notch, bring your hand, one hand to the thigh. And before you bring the leg up, see if you can actually engage the thigh first. So like, like if you're going to flex the muscle, right? Um, and then keep that muscle flexed as you bring the leg up right away. A lot of your people, listeners, uh, a lot of the people listening, if they do that, one of the things that they're going to find out <laughs> really quick is how much work it is. Um, I've had people like, like sweating while they're doing that. And I'm like, okay, back it off, back it off, back it off. Don't try so hard. Um, because when you start to use those muscles, you start to feel yourself needing to exert a little bit of effort. So anyways, that's a great one to do because if you can get those hip flexors working, uh, that's golden. Another one, uh, which I'll tell your listeners to do is a pose called, sometimes called Superman pose. You'll come on your stomach and your hands are down by your waist and you just simply lift your legs and your chest up as high as you can off the ground. Start doing that every single day um, because one of the biggest areas that we're weak is our back muscles, especially our lower back muscles. They most, again, if I took a thousand people I would be very hard pressed to find even 10 people with strong back muscles. It just is just not happening. And a lot of that, by the way, is due to sitting, you know, we sit, we slouch, and that has a negative impact on our back muscles, the way that we sit in our cars, you know, the way that we hunch over our phones. So we're doing a lot of things in a very passive way to negatively compromise our, our, you know, neuromuscular system. So Superman is a great way to begin activating those muscles. Six seconds, six times. And those are the two best ones that I can offer you right now. Start practicing those every day. Um, and you'll notice that as you're doing them, especially right afterwards, you're going to notice two things. One, you'll feel more stable. There's a feeling of like, oh, I can stand up now, you know, <laughs> I can move around and that, and two, that the, some of the stiffness has, has gone out. 
And that stiffness is gone because, again, you've rebuilt that neuromuscular connection. It's incredible because it seems super accessible as well. I can picture myself doing the Superman yeah. multiple times a day. Um, given that, <laughs> yeah, like it's just, um, yeah, just thinking about how much we reprogram like you said, passively, our bodies are just in these states where we, um, where we, yeah, we, we just throw them around and that's, that's, there's that overuse that you were referring to before. I kind of want to take a bit of a step and I'm not sure if uh, this is the perfect segue, but your awareness of like emotions and kind of how they sort of work their way into some of this stress in the body as well, because in the, the world of yoga that we, the, the Louise Hayes kind of conversation starts to emerge a little bit as well. Like, you know, my hips are for this and my shoulders are holding that. Do you find um, that there is a, the conversation we've had thus far is very neuromuscular. Is there a space like for us to sort of unpack some of the emotions in here as well? When I'm sort of making my way towards, you know, even just exploring shame as a topic in the naked yogi um but yeah the the emotions like yeah your your awareness around some of that beautiful segue going from you know <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> so i think i'm going to make a lot of people upset who listen to this and have been led to believe that we store emotions in the hips but that's just completely horse pucky. It's just not, not true. We don't store emotions in the body. Um, I'm going to put a butt on that or a caveat to that, but we just don't. And so there's no scientific evidence um, at all to show there's any kind of emotions um, being stored in muscles or in bones um, per se. Now, of course, if you've learned a habit, like, you know, you, you, you think about the archetypical dog, um, one of the things that you should never do is hit a dog with your hand uh, because when you bring your hand up to them in the future, like to pet them, say, good boy, um, they will then, you know, shy away. So there's, there's a learned behavior. And so the learned behavior, again, is in the neuromuscular system. So th there's a learned behavior that can happen um, or in the neuro system. I don't know if neuromuscular system is correct, but, you know, in, in, in the nervous system, that's a better word. In the nervous system, there's a learned behavior. Uh, now, that was one but. So I wanted to just put that out there. You can learn behaviors and part of us is trying to unlearn some of those behaviors. Um, you know, one learned behavior is slouching. So, you know, when we start, our nervous system starts to become wired. It's not even just in the muscular system. It's in the neuro system, the nervous system. You start to develop that habit of slouching. So that can definitely have an effect. The other area where emotions can have a negative effect, of course, is stress. So always the result of stress is inflammation. Uh, so, you know, sometimes when people, you asked me a question earlier, like how long, if, if you can, if you, you know, is muscle activation going to work right away? Yes. How long is it going to stay working? Well, it depends. I mean, if you, if I work on you and you're strong and then you go home and have a argument with your partner or, or a good friend or whoever, and you get really angry, well, that's going to be a stress that could probably be, have a negative impact on that neuromuscular connection, causing that muscle tightness uh, to return, of course. Um, we know that stress impacts us so negatively. Um, I mean, I've, I've sometimes been ravenous and wanted to eat, and then all of a sudden I got a horrible email from a guest or a client or somebody, and then my appetite just went away because I was got so stressed out about you know, what I read or something. So we know that stress uh, negatively impacts us. Um, I would say that that is where it starts to have a negative impact on the body. But, you know, from a science perspective, we don't store emotions in hips. We don't. And I also just want to add in something else. We don't need to release the hips. Like this is a term that you hear so much, like we need to release the shoulders or release the hips, or another word is open the hips and open the shoulders. And we need to kind of like reframe a lot of this stuff because 
it just doesn't biomechanically make sense. And it's causing a lot, lot more harm than good because now people are starting to become obsessed with, I need to release my hips so I can let go of my emotional past. Um, you know, <laughs> and so, so, and they, that was me. And that led, that journey led me to the uh, emergency room of a hospital, you know, with an orthopedic surgeon wanting to do a spinal fusion. So we need to start reframing some of this stuff and come back to good science um, with it. So is the terminology to activate our hips and to activate our shoulders? Is that the terminology? Yes. Yes. I like that. Actually, I've never used that term before, but activate your hips, activate your life, baby. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec. I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more in control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emmerich at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emmerich, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www amrit.coach forward slash life. That's www.amrit.coach forward slash L-I-F-E. There is a link in the show notes below to book in that call. And yeah, if you want to take your journey further, if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life, if it's for you, please do check it out. And without too much further ado, once again, for your spirit, for yourself, today's podcast. Take me back a little bit then. Now you're again the the renegade spirit here. The what is like you're in New York and you've got a yoga studio. I know it took a while to sort of get there, and you started with these. I don't want to say random, but was it random? Like, how did you end up being the naked yogi? Like, what is going <laughs> on? Like, why was this a thing? And and it was so well received. Like, what? what yeah. Why do you think it was so? Like, what just? unpack please yeah sure for the record when i started my naked yoga classes my nude yoga classes i prefer to say nude yoga that no 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 there's just it's a subtle difference but it's a big difference to me but there when i started it, it was just going to be a six month adventure i didn't think for at all that it would ever grow but about four months in, Time Out New York did a piece on us and blew us up and called us an underground sensation. So how did I get into it? I, I went to an all-boys boarding school. So that was one part that played into it. And I'm a huge believer in this experience really has shaped my worldview. But I'm a huge believer in, you know, that men thrive when we get to hang out with each other um not all the time obviously but you know that there's that we have space where we can hang out with each other and what i have observed consistently is 
healing always takes place. No matter what it is, healing always takes place when we get to spend uh, time together. You can think about the archetypical, um, stereotypical uh, male, you know, in Midwest America. You know, he's got a stressful job and, you know, he's his wife is demanding and he's got kids. Yeah. And so what does he do to recharge? He goes fishing and he goes fishing with his mates. And uh, what do they do? They sit in a boat together, grunt a lot. And there's a lot of silence sometimes, um, but they get to just be men with each other. And that completely allows him to come back to his source, you know, and what's important. And I observed this continuously uh, throughout my life. So I went to an all boys boarding school that shaped that worldview and started that experience. Another thing that shaped my experience was I grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and Vancouver, Canada is very well known for one of the most infamous uh, naked beaches, nude beaches in the world called Rec Beach. And so that became my home in the summertime. And I remember, you know, I went to the beach in the daytime and then I worked in a nightclub. That's another part of my past. I worked in a bar, go-go dancing and uh, waitering. <laughs> and so, so there was a part of me, I would be at the bar, it was a gay bar. And it w- I would kind of like look around and go, this is fun, but it would be more fun if we were, I- I'm going to say this just because of this podcast, in a non-sexual nude environment. And, um, and what would that be like if we could do something like that? So that kind of thought stuck with me for a long time. And flash forward, I ended up in New York. And I was walking down the street one day and I thought, naked yoga. And I got to the the part, I got to 6th Avenue and 23rd Street. And I remember it happened right in the middle of the crosswalk and it dropped right in hot nude yoga. (laughs) And so like literally it was like inspiration just dropped in. And so that's where it started. And then, you know, four months later, Time Out New York comes and does an article on us and calls us an underground sensation. And we just blew up from there Um, and in a lot of journeys. But I want to kind of just share with you a very quick story because you're from down under. And so over the years, one of my goals and dreams was to go to Australia. And so in 2000, I ended up in Mardi Gras in Australia. And it was, oh my God, one of the most amazing times of my life, that trip. I could go on for two hours and tell you about little parts of that trip. But it really changed me and who I was as a person and so many levels. But Mardi Gras, and so I had this dream of going back to Sydney, going back to Australia and leading a retreat. Anyways, I finally got it together. I think it was 2012 or 2013. So it was many, many, many years later. And we get there, we go, we go to the outback and I wanted to bring us, bring these guys to Uluru, uh, Ayers Rock. And so we get there and we get to the station. Now, by this time, hot new yoga had become very infamous and when we pulled up to the guard station, it was four o'clock in the morning. He goes to us, are you those naked yoga guys? <laughs> I have no idea how he heard about us, but somehow this guy found out in the middle of the outback. <laughs> it was like, there's going to be no, no naked yoga up there, mate. Hey guys, have you ever felt like you have wanted to break the mold on traditions and things that you've learned? Like obviously the rebellious spirit is very strong here for Yogi Aaron. I'd love to find out more about the, your rebellious spirit. What are some things that you've rebelled against in your life and actually seen through and potentially what are some of the fruits of that labor? Sometimes things might've gone wrong. What are some of your failures? What are some of the fruits of that labor? Let me know in the comment section below. <laughs> I guess it is already hot. <laughs> you just have to take your clothes off. Maybe you're exactly. inspired. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, like, are there elements of when men get together? Because there is, I love how you're describing the healing nature of men getting together. And there is something definitely in there. And, you know, you can imagine even just as we're having this conversation, there's a primal element to that as well. You know, we, 
we hunted in packs, we you know bonded in packs, and you know, there was this time when men were out doing their own thing um, together as a unit um, to sort of achieve certain outcomes and goals together. The the naked bit about the shame, like, is it like over conquering that? Because I think there's a massive element to that in society, right? Like, there's this, especially. I don't know, a lot of marketing, I feel, just plays on so many of our fears. And one of the deepest fears is is this self-worth thing. And the easy sort of machete to hack into that is is this shame piece. And I think it's it's often leveraged around us and we don't even notice that people are people are pushing those buttons. Yeah, I I lot one of the biggest questions people always ask me is, well, can't you guys just get together and with your clothes on? Yeah, we could. And we did a lot of activities. I mean, we, you know, the Australian trip was two parts. One part was the you retreat. You weren't naked the whole we... time is what, is what you say. saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the second part was the, you know, the like, let's go on an adventure. And so that whole part was, you know, clothed. And, but no, the answer is no, you can't do this clothes. It, you have to have a naked component you have to have a nude component and so nude and the, the difference between nude and naked naked is like you know i'm naked emotionally naked like i'm exposed where nude is getting you back to your natural state of being and one of the things that i constantly observed as i was teaching these classes i knew my students names i didn't know who they were Sometimes it would be three or four years before I would get to know some of them. And I'd find out that guy was a Wall Street banker. That guy was a CEO on a top firm. That guy is a starving artist in the village. Um, So you had this, like all of these different people that you could never know who they were because they weren't wearing their Gucci, you know, shoes or um, their, their fancy ties or whatever, they just showed up in their natural state. And that was for me where the authenticity began in, in a lot of Southeast Asian cultures, especially in India, when you go into temple or you go into somebody's house, what do you do? You take your shoes off and you do that because you're saying, this is my ego. I'm checking it at the door. And I always felt like our clothes carry so much of our ego, the way that we dress and the kind of clothes that we buy. And so for me, like this disrobing before you enter the space was very symbolic. And I can't overstate that enough, like how potent that was for people to walk into the room nude, especially, of course, for people, as you can imagine, if it was their first, you know, two, three, four times. But I'll tell you something. I don't I, I don't really teach nude yoga anymore. But once in a while, I make a guest appearance. Um, I travel to a city and, and a teacher there says, hey, Aaron, can you come and do something for us? I'm like, oh, OK, sure. I'm always it's always a pleasure. But there's this anxiety in me to strip my clothes down because I just don't do it anymore. And um, there's this like momentary anxiety, like, oh my God, I'm about to become nude with these people. And so there's this moment for me and I have to do it like an inner check. You use the word shame. I have to kind of like check in with my own, you know, what is there shame here? Like what's, what is that about? And then I just do it and, you know, a lot of people, most, most times people forget that they're nude within the first 30 to 60 seconds. Like you just, it just becomes irrelevant very quickly. Um, and it then becomes something that's very pleasurable. It's like, I can just be myself. And that's, that is like the biggest mission or was the biggest mission is, was of hot new yoga back then was like, let's celebrate our authenticity you know, so many people in a lot of spiritual circles talk about authenticity and we can go on a whole rabbit hole about that. But I would just kind of say a lot of them don't know what authenticity is. If you said, hey, let's get naked, they're not doing it. Um, there's like this huge amount of shame and, and and that's built in and the clothes cover it and hide it. And so again, when we can become uh, exposed with each other, um, 
it's like I would say that there's a more direct line to a person's heart, which is kind of weird to say that because you think like, oh, I'm going to get naked or nude to, you know, for sexual pleasure with somebody else, you know. But in that moment, um, there is a more direct line to the heart. And when I said in the beginning of this conversation that I thought that it would only last six months and then it blew up. I kind of knew by the second, third class that something was happening and I could see it in the way that the guys were starting to relate to each other and connect with each other. And it wasn't, you know, my friend Barb Schwartz always said, hug from the heart, not from the hips. And then you never get your signals mixed. And so, (laughs) and I can just tell you that I saw a lot of heartfelt hugs and in soulful connections. I'll tell you one exercise that I did a lot. And this was sort of a staple in every single class. It was simply bring, we did a lot of partner yoga. There was like yoga that you do by yourself. And then there's partner, uh, sometimes some people call it contact yoga. But the, the primer for anything that we did was just bring your hand to your partner's heart, look in their eyes and breathe with them. It's very potent. When you're standing naked in front of somebody and you just put your hand on their heart and just breathe and make eye contact, that is like one of the most powerful, healing, authentic experiences you can have with any human being. It's very, very powerful. There's a piece dropping in here around, um, (laughs) and maybe you can help me iron out the cobwebs on this piece, which is it feels like modesty inhibits intimacy when it comes to yeah. authenticity um is that fair enough to to say yeah i mean there's a whole conversation to be had around that as well because i i you know as i've gotten older and i want to say wiser oh wise you'll be <laughs> there's, wisdom, there's wisdom in the way you've said that as well i have to, I have to admit. <laughs> i think that there. modesty no this is going to sound very contradictory but you know i've been to india 12 times it's the land of contradictions so the spiritual teachings there's many contradictions but there really isn't um i think that there is a place for sometimes modesty so i want to be careful with my words because i do feel like one of the things my business partner who was in a monastery uh, for about the first six years from like age 18 to 25, he was in the monastery. One of the monks used to always say to him, his name is Adam, um, custody of the eyes, brother Adam. So our eyes, where our eyes go is where our attention goes. And so, you know, as humans, it's important that we think about how other people are viewing us as well from that perspective, you know? And um, so the eyes are the most powerful of the senses. And so we need to, you know, have custody of our own eyes, but also be aware of what we're projecting. And going back to that exercise, you know, I said, bring your hand to the heart and then look in the person's eyes and breathe. And so now you're standing there in your very natural state, but you're also having intention. And the intention is, I want to connect with this person's soul and heart. And um, so, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. (laughs) No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I know you've got a way with words. um, And so I wanted to tune into what does OSA mean and why is it called the Blue OSA Retreat? And we were talking about missions and that was like nude yoga was a mission and still probably is carried out in the world, but OSA seems to be the mission. Um, What's, what does OSA mean and what does it mean to you? OSA, well, the word OSA comes from Spanish. So the literal translation is bear. It's a female bear. Um, I actually didn't know that for a long time. <laughs> when I named, uh, when we named our place Blue OSA, um, Blue OSA, my yoga retreat in Costa Rica is located on the OSA Peninsula, or in Spanish, La Peninsula de OSA. And so that that was one part of it. And the other part was my favorite color is blue. And when you're at Blue Osa, most times of the year when the sun is bright, you look out in the ocean and you see that beautiful turquoise blue color. 
and it's it's mesmerizing. I, I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen, you know, that turquoise blue color, but it's just it's majestic, and you can just watch it all day. And so when we named it Blue Osa, it was like we're on the Osa, and blue is my favorite color. That's sort of really honestly how it came apart, came together. But then afterwards, it was like, wow, this is a really cool thing. We've merged Spanish and English. Um, it's seven letters. So you mentioned the word, the, the thing seven before. So, um, and then uh, the other thing is it's three syllables. So, you know, it embodies the Trinity, you know, within us, the creator, the sustainer and the destroyer. Um, so it kind of keeps all of those things in check. It's kind of a cool name. How did, um, how's the, for those that are tuning in that want to dive in deeper into your work, we discussed earlier some of the courses and the book, um, but for those that want to experience retreats at OSA, is possible still? They're not nude retreats <laughs> anymore. No, 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 <laughs> There's no, no. a very different vibe going on, um, just to clarify. <laughs> um, but yeah, for those that are interested in, in, a, in a beautiful holiday to to Costa Rica to come do some retreats? How do they find out more about Blue Osa? Absolutely. I mean, just Google Blue Osa. So the word blue, B-L-U-E, and then Osa, O-S-A. If you Google that, our webpage will pop up. Um, and everything that's ever been said about Blue Osa will pop up. Um, and we offer like, so there's three kind of ways that people can experience Blue Osa. The first way, obviously, is just come as a guest you know, uh, come on a personal retreat or a spa vacation. Uh, we're right on the beach. Uh, it's just, it's just beautiful. The second way is just join a retreat. So we host probably about 25, uh, yoga retreats a year with just all kinds of yoga teachers. They bring their groups and, and organize groups and organize programs. And so that's a great way to come and experience Blue Osa. And then the third way is come and join me. Come and join me on um, a yoga immersion. I teach yoga teacher training immersions, which is, I think, one of the best ways to learn yoga, best ways to learn a, a yama, um, and then also dive deep into these spiritual teachings. The yoga tradition is so rich and has so much to offer us. And I get into it with people. Um, and my mission in these yoga teacher training immersions is a fewfold, but the biggest one is to really give people a sense of clarity or to, I don't really give it to them. They give it to themselves, but I provide the space, you know, hold space for people through the practices and through Blue Osa to begin to tap into what their life purpose is and I have found consistently that when we are in touch with purpose, uh, we feel more confident. We feel uh, an internal sense of indomitable willpower because we're clear in what we're doing and we're able to go back out into our lives, becoming a better version of ourselves. So that's what people can experience at Blue Osa. <laughs> and what is your life's purpose, would you say? Ooh, that's a few folds. Um, one of them is to be a trailblazer and to challenge. I don't want to say challenge systems because that sounds comes across as negative, but to kind of shine light um, in areas where we start acting without awareness. And, and just one of those examples is the stretching business. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of, I, I, I don't mean this in a disparaging way, although it comes across as disparaging. That's not my intention at all, but it's like the blind leading the blind sometimes. And, you know, so many of us have heard stretching is good. So we just go out and do it. And, we don't question it. We don't question things. So that's part of my mission is to question things. And um, and another part of my purpose is to find myself as I'm unfolding. I'm continuously unfolding. And I'm always curious what it, what is really behind, um, you know, this that's coming out right now. 
and that is always a warning. Uh, one of my favorite teachers, her name is um, Clarissa Pinkola Estes, and she wrote the book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. Um, you should try to interview her if it's even possible. She's an amazing, incredible woman, and you can go and find um, not the audio book, but the audio version of the book. It's two parts. It's two hours, and it's up on YouTube. Um, it's also available for purchase. And but one of the things that she says is, people often say to me, "Who are you? Who are you really?" And she says, "Who I am is still a borning." And what I can tell you is that I'm quite friendly. While I'm quite friendly, I'm not quite tame. <laughs> so may it be for you. And that's kind of how I feel like my purpose in life is. It's a borning and I'm not yet tamed. <laughs> Aaron, thank you so much for being here today with us, for sharing yourself so abundantly, um, as you always would. But nonetheless, I have to thank you for it. Um, not that it's begrudging. <laughs> a celebration <laughs> um, but also i think the piece with the butt is yeah like you know it's this today's conversation stands on the shoulders of yeah like even running blue osa <laughs> like a retreat center man like so much goes into that a total labor of love and the nude yoga and everything that you're doing now trying to buck you know with muscle activation and there must be so much um that you're up against in terms of just what the norm and the conform is and it's just you know decades upon decades of space, being in the yoga space that really enriches and informs this conversation and we get to stand on the shoulders of all of that today here. So thank you so much for you, man, and just really appreciate you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much for having me here and asking these really great questions and, and and interested to go deeper than the surface. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Alrighty, guys, you made it all the way through to the end of another episode. Thank you so much. Now, obviously, you like this video, so give it a thumbs up. And I'd love to hear from you. You've tuned all the way through to the end. What are some of your thoughts on the video? What's some of the comments that you'd like to make? Leave them in the show notes below. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments section. And also, if you really love this channel, please do hit subscribe. It helps so much with everything we're trying to do here around promoting positivity into the world further, wider, just making it more and more positive through each episode with so much love. Now, if you love this episode, you're also going to really love a conversation we had with Kelly Marie Kerr. She talks about the yoga of Christianity. It's about Christianity meeting yoga and coming together in your body. Some really sacred insights that have been hidden for quite some time. That video is on screen for you to go check out now. And there's also another couple of videos on screen for help you basically to continue your inspired evolution journey. If you are so inspired, click on one of the videos on screen now and I'll see you in the next one.